Yeah. See you, Scott. See ya. <laughs> All right, we're good. All right. To begin here, do you mind uh, saying and spelling your name? Uh, my name is Mike Copeland, M-I-K-E-C-O-P-E-L-A-N-D. And again, do you mind just repeating your name saying, you know, hi, my name is Mike Copeland? I thought I did. I know. They don't want me to do it again. Okay. <laughs> hi, my name is Mike Copeland, M-I-K-E, no? You don't, you don't have to I thought you I thought you said to say it and spell it. <laughs> no, no, just say it. Just say it this time. <laughs> this ain't going to work. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Mike Copeland. Mr. Copeland, uh, how many years did you work at Ford Warner? I worked at Ford Warner for 40 years. I hired in right out of high school in 1968 and worked till the plant closed in 2009. I was there for 40 years. What kind of machines did you work with out there? What, what did you do? Uh, when I first hired in, um, I hired in on the labor crew. I was uh, sweeping floors, changing sawdust around the machines, pulling shavings. Then I kind of moved through the plant. I run um, Barbara Coleman's gear cutting, uh, some shapers and also gear cutting. Most of my production work was in the gear cutting production area when I worked production. And from there I trans or progressed into uh, non-production. I was uh, in an assembler for a while. And I worked assembly for about a year, and then I got in the inspection quality department, and I kind of finished my career in the quality department. So there's definitely a progression of, of, of work out there. You know, you start at the bottom, and you got to build your way up. Is it, is it like that with shifts, too? Did you work night? Or? Well, you, it all depends on your seniority, how long you've been there. Uh, if you, One of the younger guys, you generally get caught on the off shifts because the older guys work days. And as you get more seniority and the jobs open up on the day shift, you try to bump back on the days. As far as the jobs, um, there's good jobs and bad jobs, and you, usually the younger guys get stuck with the rougher jobs, and then you kind of progress and get the better jobs as you get more seniority. But as far as production and non-production, I guess it's just what you want to do at Warner Gear. Um, production gets pretty monotonous every day. You go in and do the same thing over and over and over, and it, it just makes for a long day. But there are some interesting jobs, but uh, most of them are just pretty redundant. You're just going to circle all day, putting the gear in, taking the gear out, well, non-production, as far as uh, gear quality or, or uh, in inspection, that type of work, or labor, you get to move around a little bit. You're not tied down to one spot, so it makes it a little, the day a little more endurable, I guess you'd say. <clears throat> uh, out of board, Warner, were you ever, uh, I, know, I know you participated in this 18, 1989 strike. Uh, can, you, can you describe that a little bit? Were you laid off ever more than that, or how did that work? Uh, yes. Uh, in your early years, when you've got less seniority, you do you are subject to layoffs. Uh, I hired in in 1968, and I worked until I believe it was 1970. At that time, I got laid off. They had a reduction. Um, I can't tell you how many, but it was quite a few. And really, I was pretty lucky because I was eligible for the draft at that time, and I went right into the Naval Reserves and done two years of active duty in the Navy. And during that time, I would have been laid off, but however, I was overseas in Vietnam and then I got called back to work when I got released from the Navy so it worked out pretty good and then um, after I came back from the Navy in 1973 I probably was laid off several more times until approximately the 80s and then I had enough time where the layoffs didn't catch up with me and I've been working ever since. <clears throat> now, did you grow up in Muncie? Yes, yes. So what was it like growing up in Muncie? Did do you remember Board Warner as a, as a child being something important? Uh, yes, I grew up uh, on the south end of Muncie, around Hicken Park, and I attended school at St. Lawrence School, which is uh, just on Charles Street, which is just right next door to the old Board Warner Plant One. And I would, my parents would take me to school, and then we would walk home, and I walked by that plant every day, and I would see the guys sitting in the windows with their shop towels and their lunch buckets, always wondering what went on in that plant. And then I know in the summers when my mother would uh, take us out to Plant 3 on Kilgore and pick up Dad's paycheck, we would pull in the parking lot and he'd be waiting on us with his shop towels and his apron on. He'd hand her the paycheck and away we'd go. So I was very familiar with Borg Warner, but I never thought I'd work there. Uh, and then eventually in 1968, I did hire in. Uh, the way that happened was I was um, just out of high school. I just, just graduated from Muncie Southside. And I was working at the Coca-Cola bottling plant with several of my friends. We were working afternoons from like 3 to 11. And my dad came over. Uh, I was still living at home at the time. And uh, he had an application in his hand for, for Warner Gear. And he asked me if he th 
if I thought I would like to work at Warner Gear, and I, I had no idea. I said, well, I, you know, I don't know. I said, what kind of money you make? He said, well, we make more than you make. So luckily, the employment manager lived across the street from us, and he knew they were going to start hiring several people, and he thought he'd give me a shot at it. So I, uh, I said, well, give me the application, and I'll bring it home tonight and fill it out. And I took it to the manager's house that night. It was like 11 o'clock at night. And he asked me what I thought, and I said, yeah, I think I'll give it a try. He said, can you be there in the morning? And I was hired the next day. And it was very fortunate on my part because that gave me seniority on a lot of people that were going to hire down the road, and that kept me working when they were laid off. <clears throat> and that happened, uh, do you think that family connection happened with a lot of employees? Uh, I think at that time we had a clause in the contract. I'm not familiar with it because I was relatively young then. I think we had hiring, preferential hiring rights for family members at that time something you probably couldn't do nowadays, but because uh, um, most of the guys that hired in in that era, their dads did work out there, so there was probably some kind of a connection. Um, as, as, much, as far as you could tell, <coughs> local residents view Board Warner. Uh, you obviously had family connections, so you had, you had an insider view, but how do you think other people outside the community view, view Board Warner and its workers? Um, did you hear things around town? Or? Well, like, you know, there were several factories in this area, Chevy and Delco, and I think everybody had the same opinion of them. Uh, they were good jobs, good benefits, but they often heard the stories that guys went in there and didn't do anything all day long. And it, it's easy to say that, but once you get in there, you can make a hard job look easy. And granted, there were some good jobs and some bad jobs where guys didn't bust their butts, you know, eight hours a day, but there were guys on that machine that were working to keep that place running. And I think some of my friends had that opinion that guys went in there every day and really didn't do much to get that big paycheck. And, but most of them had a, a fond memory of, of Warner Gear. I mean, it was a, it was a pillar here in, in the Muncie. It uh, fed a lot of families, raised a lot, a lot of kids, you know, put them through school. I know I, I run into the employment manager just this past weekend. His name was Wentz Marcus. I saw him at a car show. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, I often wondered if I'd done you a favor by hiring you at Warner Gear. And I said, you know, Wentz, everything I got, I owe to Warner Gear. I uh, made a pretty good living out there, met a lot of nice people, so I've got no regrets. Um, there was a lot of days I didn't feel like getting up and going in, but he got up because, you know, you had to get there and get that paycheck. So. <clears throat> I, I want to remind you um, to try, if you can, I know it's just boring, to repeat kind of the question. Oh, okay. So Okay. That would be hard for me to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, Sometimes a little awkward. Um, how, how would you describe the union's role in, in your life at Board Warner? Uh, how would I describe the union's role in my life at Board Warner? As a worker, um, for your family, how does the union protect that? Um, the, um, the union played a pretty important role early on at Borg Warner because, you know, it's hard for a company to give up profits when they can keep them without giving them to the workers. And over years, they, they done some bargaining and got us some pretty good, pretty good wages and benefits. Uh, one being a pension that I'm drawing right now that you don't even think about when you're young. You always think about what's on that paycheck. But I think, and I, and I hate to say this because I'm proud of being a, a union member and I've been a, an officer in that union, but I think it outgrew its, it overstepped its bounds later on. I think it, it kept pushing that company to where they had no recourse but to either say, we need help or we're going to move. I mean, there comes a time when you've got to use a little common sense. And even the strike of 1989, and I was financial secretary at the time, uh, we fought for insurance rights. But the ironic part was we were out eight weeks and a lot of hard feelings and we did retain our insurance benefits, but we give up 97 cents of future cost of living to pay for them benefits. So did we accomplish anything? I don't know. And, and then this last uh, fiasco out there where <clears throat> the company come from more concessions um, and the union refused to talk to them. I thought we were wrong in that aspect. I think we should have at least talked to them to find out what they wanted or what it would have took to keep this plant in Muncie and provide jobs, but we didn't, and 
we're here where we're at now, so. So there's a, sort of a communication breakdown between labor and management. Um, can you describe maybe early on, did that change over time? Kind of the, well, as far as the communication between the union and the company, I think they've always communicated, but I just think the union held the company hostage because we were the only game in town. Either you wanted our services or we went on strike. And, you know, the company more or less come to the table because they didn't want to shut down big companies like Ford and General Motors. And was that right or wrong? I don't know. I mean, I always thought we made a good living out there. And should we continue to push them, you know, to the brink of where they couldn't exist anymore? You used to always think that that plant could never move. It was just too big. But I know in 1998 when they moved the transmission business out, I've seen a lot of machineries just picked up and moved just like that in no time at all. And that kind of woke me up to the fact that, hey, this plant could be gone someday. It can be moved. Just because the machines weigh a few tons, they can move them. And I saw that in 98. They did move the transmission business out and left us with just the uh, uh, transfer case business. And that kind of jeopardized our existence because all our eggs were in one basket. And you know the story on SUVs, they slowed down, gas went through the roof, and people aren't buying them, so they don't need our product. And uh, it kind of kind of caught up with us, I guess. I, I don't want to sound anti-union, because the union has been very good to me over the years, and I don't think we would have the benefits and the pay that we've got today without them. But I think you have to use a little common sense how far you push that company, because they've got to make a profit. If they don't make a profit, they're not going to be around and uh, where we're at today, so. <clears throat> what, do you, what do you remember, what are some recollections about the strikes? That you well, um, as far as the strike in 1989, some of my memories are, um, we, uh, of course we went out and um, it was, I don't think it really sunk in right off the bat what we were doing, I mean, as far as the members, how serious it was. And as the strike progressed, I think it started weighing on people's minds, hey, we need to get back in there, you know, that's our job out there. Because the company was running some limited production without our services. I remember some of the episodes out there on 32, uh, ball bats and throwing the nails and scratching the tires or scratching the cars and flattening the tires, which you have them in all strikes. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but uh, I think there was other ways to settle that. Um, and then I know I got the call from Sam Dragoo, our president, that we had a tentative agreement. And it was my job to find a location to have a, have a ratification meeting. And it was kind of ironic because we wanted to get a nice, he, he said, get a nice facility. Because if you go to the field house, the acoustics aren't real well and you can't hear. So I wanted to rent uh, Emmons Auditorium at Ball State. And I called, uh, I gave it a guy named David Fronick. He was the manager of the Emmons Auditorium at the time. And um, he was out of town. I said, well, surely there's somebody there that I can talk to about renting this auditorium due to what we had to, t to take care of. And um, they said, we're sorry, nobody's here. And I said, you mean Emmons just shuts down when, I said, we need a nice facility. They said, we're sorry, we can't help you. And I thought that was kind of odd. That, Ball State University didn't have somebody who could rent that auditorium to us. So I called Mayor Carey at the time and told him our situation. I said, man, we really need a nice place to have this meeting to get us back to work. He said, I'll get right back with you. It probably wasn't 15 minutes and I got a phone call back from Mr. Carey and he says, you've got him in his auditorium. He somehow he took care of it. So anyhow, we had our meeting and it was ratified and I went to settle up with this Mr. Fonicky, the manager out there at the time. I introduced myself in the lobby there of the meeting, and I said, we need to settle up on the charges. He said, there are no charges. He said, when people like you are out of work, he said, they don't attend functions at Emmons Auditorium, and we're out of work. He said, so we want you back to work. So they didn't charge us for using the facility, which I thought was pretty nice. Uh, but uh, it was a long strike, in my opinion. I'd been on several small ones before that for two or three weeks at the most, but once you're out, and you're out there eight weeks, uh, you wonder, will I get back in that place? And uh, eventually we did, and it worked out pretty well. But uh, there were a lot of hard feelings when we went back. 
Uh, I had some real good friends on supervision. That, you know, we had to get through that. And, and eventually it worked out, but it took time. It took time. <clears throat> that, this, the Emmons uh, story really speaks to kind of the connection between the union or the workers and the community. Um, do you have any recollections, or what role do you think the union played uh, within the community? Were there uh, functions that the union sponsored, or can you speak a little on that? Uh, as far as activities at the union over time, um, I can remember back before I went into Warner Gear, um, they sponsored us in Junior League Baseball. We were the local 287 Chiefs. And I think one of the prerequisites was your father had to work at Warner Gear, be a union member to play. And we had some very good teams back then. Uh, I remember we had Easter egg hunts, we had skating parties. Um, uh, and I know my mom and dad, um, growing up when I was still, before I went to Warner Gear, would always attend functions at the Labor Center down on, they always called it 1125 South Walnut. That was the old Labor Center. They would have dances there on Saturday, Fridays and Saturdays, and they would attend there with a lot of their friends. And um, I know as far as the union, well, this is kind of a company union joint venture. We sponsored uh, blood drives at Borg Warner, of which I was chairman of that committee for several years. And, we solicited a lot of blood donors over the years for Ball Hospital. We've even got a Hall of Fame out there where guys have given gallons of blood over the years. They, I would go out and recruit on a, on a Tuesday, sign up about 20 donors for the next day, and uh, kind of it was kind of a three-way arrangement. Uh, the company would provide us for an hour to go down and donate blood. Uh, the vending service would donate soft drinks and milk and things, and the union would buy donuts for the guys that donated. And over the years, we've donated, we've donated thousands of gallons of blood to Ball Hospital, which they've been very appreciative over the years. And uh, we had a lot of uh, softball teams over the years, which I played softball years ago. And I think at one time, we, we sponsored seven softball teams in the softball leagues there at Muncie. Uh, another activity that the union had was the bowling league. We had a, one of the oldest bowling leagues here in Muncie on Monday night. And you had to get on a waiting list to get in that league over the years. And, uh, a lot of activities like that. As a matter of fact, uh, we even had a softball team in 1983, I believe, that went to the National Softball Tournament out in Oklahoma City. And our general manager at that time, uh, Ken Thorpe, uh, was kind of a softball nut. And he came and watched our games as we qualified here in town to win the district and the state. And he said he wanted to do it right. He chartered a, a Trailways bus. He even paid us some wages, lost wages to go out there, put us up at the Hilton in Oklahoma City. And our team finished third that year. Out of 88 teams across the country, we got third place, which we were pretty proud of at the time. And most of these guys were made up of local 287 members. There weren't many salary people. There were some, but not many. It was mostly union people. So those are some of the memories that I have of the union over the years. Uh, how, did, how did Borg Warner, um, first of all, I guess, <clears throat> Did you encourage your, your any family members, your son, like, uh, to go into working at Borg Warner? Or how did, how did the company affect your family? Uh, as far as the company affecting my family, um, like I say, it's given me a pretty good um, living standard over the years. I've always had a nice home and nice vehicles. My kids attended uh, a private school. They attended St. Lawrence. But as far as them going to to Borg Warner, I don't think I wanted that atmosphere for them. I mean, if they wanted to do it, that'd be fine with me because, like I say, I have no regrets, but I think there's better ways to make a living than going in a factory every day. And uh, that factory has grown leaps and bounds as far as cleanliness over the years. The old wooden block floors and the sawdust and just the grime and the, and the, the dirt in what they called the end building where they had cast iron. It was like working in a coal mine down there. And over the years, they've cleaned that all up, and, and there's actually paint on the floors now. I never thought I'd see that day. But as far as my family, I probably would have steered them in a different direction. But if they wanted to go there, maybe in a salary role would have been nice. But as far as running the machine, I don't think, I think there's better things to do than, than be a factory operator, nowadays anyway. Did, uh, you, you mentioned your father. Um, did you have any other members who worked at family? Uh, as far as family members at, at Borg Warner, uh, my father hired in there in 1946 and he worked 31 years and retired in 1977 
And he's still alive to this day. He's been retired longer than he worked. As far as other family members, I had a brother, uh, David, that worked there in 1973. And he worked on one of the, probably the heaviest lines in the plant. It was called the Big Eight, the big uh, gear for the truck transmission. And he said, I knew right then that that wasn't what I wanted to do. So he got an education and got an accounting degree. I had a brother, another brother named Danny who hired in in 1973, was a machine operator. And he said, this is not my cup of tea. I'm not cut out to be tied down to machines. So he didn't, he got laid off and never went back. But he did come back eventually back in the 90s as a skilled tradesman. He got his plumbing license and come back and was just tickled to death to be working in a plant. Uh, and he worked, he, unfortunately he only had about seven years when the plant closed. I also had a sister that worked out there. She hired in as a manpower uh, employee and they eventually brought her on as a salary employee. She worked in the office, different roles. And then uh, as the reductions came, she got uh, offered a buyout and she took advantage of it about three years ago, I believe it was. But uh, that's our legacy as far as family members uh, working at Warner Gear. <clears throat> Warner Gear was obviously one of the major employers in Muncie. Um, can you can you really uh, talk a little bit more about how uh, the significance of its closing uh, to the Muncie community, uh, to your family, to just in general, I suppose? Uh, as far as Warner Gear's significance to the community and its closing, what effect it will have, I think it's going to have a major impact. Um, there was a lot of people that when we did shut down, didn't re reach that age to retire. So here they are going from making a good salary to no salary. And no prospects really of any good paying jobs left around here, with Borg Warner being one of the last manufacturing facilities. Um, fortunately, I was able to get my 30 years and retire. I, I should be okay. I mean, I'll have a, we call it mailbox money coming every month. But a lot of my friends won't, and I think that's going to hurt this community. As, as you know, we're facing some economic times right now anyway, even with Borg Warner. So without them, I think this community is going to lose that tax base and compound them economic woes that they're facing now, and it's, it's going to be tough. Um, and it's going to have the trickle-down effect with the tool-and-die shops, the grocery stores, the restaurants. People won't go out and eat and buy things like they did as much. Uh, so it, it's, it's going to have an adverse effect on this community, in my opinion. It may take time, but eventually, um, maybe new jobs will replace the old ones. I don't know. I hope so. <clears throat> have, have you heard about this Bravini wind plant that's, that's <clears throat> proposed, or I guess it's going to be built out in, uh, somewhere out here? In as far as the Bravini plant, uh, yes, I've heard about it and read about it, but, and, and I don't know that much about it as far as gears, but I don't think it's going to be the same gear technology that we've grown up with in, in transmissions for cars. It's got to be on a larger scale, I would think, because I've seen these wind turbines. I was fortunate to uh, take a cruise to Europe several years ago. And I've seen some of these big wind turbines in Amsterdam, and they're humongous. And I'm sure it takes a lot bigger gears to turn something like that than it does to move a car or a, an automobile. Uh, but, but it's a job though. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably on the same line of work as far as gear technology, but it's gonna be a bigger scale. And hopefully some of our employees will be able to land jobs out there. And I think that will help this community. They sound like they're good paying jobs. Uh, it remains to be seen until they get here though. <clears throat> well, Mike, that's really all I have for today. But at the end of these interviews, I wanna give you a chance to say anything that I may have missed that you think is important that you'd just like to say, a story that comes to mind or, or a thought? Um, no, like I say, I, uh, as far as my opinion of Warner Gear, it's been a very good place to work. Um, I don't know where I'd be without it. It's been very good to me and my family, uh, my, my parents. Um, my dad worked there 30 years, raised five children, put us through private schools. We weren't rich by any means, but we didn't do without, and uh, we had a good childhood. As far as my career at Warner Gear, um, like I say, I had good jobs and bad jobs. Uh, as time progresses, you try, to, you try to get the better jobs. It's just human nature. And there were days when 
It was actually fun to go to work out there. You go out there because there was always something going on. You talk about the bowling league the night before, or a softball game you played, or uh, the golf league. We had a good golf league out there. And uh, there was always something going on, but as, as we went on, I guess, as, as got older, those things kind of went away. We didn't play softball. We didn't, the bowling league kind of fell apart. We played a little golf, but we didn't have them common bonds to hold us together out there. Uh, and I've seen a change in management out there, too. Um, used to, we had guys that run that plant that had local ties, and they worried about this community. But as time progressed, we started getting outsiders to run that plant. And they were good people, don't get me wrong, but I just don't think they had the community ties that the older guys did, and they could care less what happened to that plant, as far as Muncie. Whereas the older guys, they wanted to keep this plant running and keep this community vibrant, and we kind of lost that over the years. And was it bad management? I, I hate to point fingers. I mean, it's a little bit of both, I guess. Um, operators got complacent on their jobs, didn't care. Uh, they're going to close anyway. You heard that a lot. Well, I've been hearing that for 40 years. All oh, the places are going to close, you know. And eventually it did, but it was always a threat. But I think the attitudes over the years changed. Um, when they done away with the piecework, and went to just a flat rate, I think that hurt Warner Gear Muncie because there was no incentive to keep that machine running and producing parts. Um, in the old days when you ran production, you were on a group system and one guy depended on the other guy to feed him production because if he wasn't running, he was hurting the group and if you hurt the group, you cost yourself money. Uh, as time progressed, we got to the flat rate and it didn't matter. The other saying was, it all pays the same. Well, that was true, but unless you got product going out that door, you're not drawing any income into that company to pay the bills. So it's got to work in conjunction with each other. And uh, I've seen that kind of happen over the years. But as far as my personal opinion of Warner Gear, like I said, it's been very good to me, and I have no regrets. It's, it's, been, a good, uh, it's been a good career out there. Uh, I made a lot of nice friends out there, a lot of, a lot of uh, friendships over the years, and uh, it's been a good place to work. I've, I've got no complaints, and uh, hate to see it go, but, uh, and I'd probably still be working if they were open, but uh, I'm retired, and I'm getting used to it. It's kind of, it's a pretty good life to worry about when you're going to get up and uh, what time to go to bed. You don't have to worry about that the next day, so it's been a good ride. I hate to see it end, so... Uh, that's about all I can tell you on Warner Gear. <clears throat> I've got one more question that comes to mind. Um, you seem to indicate there's a generational kind of conflict. Not, not only did the management change, but did the workers also change? Were you maybe of a generation that was more tied to, to the community? Do you think the younger workers didn't, because of the change from uh, piecework to hourly? Or um, think as far as uh, changes in uh, people's attitude, I guess, yeah, I did see a change there, um, um, and, I, and I don't want to sound like I'm knocking anybody, but i just seen a change over the years where guys were worried about quality parts out there. Unless it's a good part, you know, you're not doing the company any good or yourself any good. But over time, guys, people just didn't care. And I, my old uh, tidbit was that they were always trying to shave costs out there. And I can remember, Years ago when I hired in, they assigned you a pair of gloves and you had 10 shop towels. And you took care of them because at the end of the day, if they were dirty, you had to turn 10 shop towels in to get 10 clean ones and a dirty pair of gloves to get a clean pair of gloves. And the, the foreman would open up the towel box at about 3 o'clock when the day was done and you would go, turn your gloves and your towels and he'd give you some new ones. Well, over time, they got away from that. And this may sound chicken, but they just opened up the towel box so you could come and get as many as you wanted. And you'll see bundles of shop towels just laying all over the floor. Uh, gloves, all over, I mean, not just a pair, bundles of gloves. And I know this is not a whole lot of money, but at the end of the day, that all adds up. And it always stuck in my crawl why the company didn't manage that a little better. Uh, like I say, it wasn't, it wasn't a monumental cost, but at the end of the day, that all adds up. And uh, so, and people just, 
didn't, I didn't have the same attitude as the older operators did for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, like I say, the group, the group system had a lot to do with that because the next guy depended on you to produce his parts and make money for the group. Whereas as time went on, we didn't have a group system. And if your machine wasn't running, you weren't hurting anybody. You may have been hurting the next operation, but it wasn't costing you money because it all paid the same. And I did see that change over time. Maybe it's human nature, I don't know. If the machine's not running, you don't care. But in the old days, the, the old timers, they wanted to make sure that machine was running. They found a way to run it or found something to do when the machine wasn't running. But uh, the newer generation didn't seem to have that mentality, I guess. And I don't know if that's good or bad. But uh, as far as personal respect for your job, I always was under the inclination to keep my job orderly and clean, my gauges so they all work better. You didn't see that much nowadays. If the, if the gauge worked fine, if it didn't, don't worry about it. Well, you know, if you don't have a good gauge, you don't have a good part. And it didn't seem to bother anybody. Uh, I've seen those changes over the years. And I'm not trying to knock the younger generation, but uh, I just saw some of those changes over the years that uh, might have helped keep the place running, I don't know. But it's just little things like that. But uh, that's about uh, the only conditions I can see. So hope I've helped you out. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, that was a good interview. Thank you.